So this is a one nose standing wave, just hold it still. Can you see that all that's happening is that half a wavelength is fitting inside this distance. And as a result, it's just moving up and down inside the distance. Fair enough? That's a one nose standing wave, or one peak standing wave. Now if I move it a bit quicker, wait, let me slow down. Can you see that now it has two nodes? The full wavelength is fitted inside this whole length. And as a result, what's happening is you've got one node there, you've got one peak there, and you've one peak there. That here has two peaks. Can you see that all, that all that's happening is the wave is going up and then down? It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. It's not like a single point there. Can you see that point is not moving at all? Yeah. Right in the middle. And all that's happening is the wave is going up and down, up and down at that point. The peak is going up and down. It doesn't look like it's moving at all. And that's called a static wave when one full or half or some integer multiple of a half wave that fits inside. So that's one with three nodes, because it's got three points that don't move. One, two, and three are three times. Oh, okay. oh. I couldn't do it even faster, I can't do it for long. <laughs> yeah. You can get the four going there, yeah. you can get five nodes. Point is, um, you can create standing waves. Okay, and it just fits an integer multiple of half wave that depends on range. Should we that? What what Hertz did was he, he made these standing waves um, by reflecting using parabolic mirrors, and he effectively calculated the wavelength. So what he did was particular. You have the original wave, so you have you have a source you have a source of waves, continuous waves are being released. We'll have a normal wave passing through like this. Maybe I'll use this color this time. So you'll have a normal wave passing through like that. And what it did was, he reflected one of the waves that were coming up in this direction. Remember, waves go up in all directions. He reflected one of the waves that come up in this direction with the parabolic mirror. And as a result, by constructing the interfering, then what happens with standing waves is that the point at which standing waves form are the points at which constructive interference occurs. So by looking at the points where, by having a spark gap at the end of the concave mirror that he was actually measuring, by moving the spark gap around, sorry, okay, around. by moving the spark gap around, wherever the, the spark was the largest is wherever the standing waves occur. That is, that is when you have an integer multiple of half wavelengths. So wherever the first one was is basically half the wavelength. The second one is a full wavelength, and so on and so forth. So by using this technique, he calculated the wavelength. So does everyone understand how he calculated the wavelength? By setting up these standing waves with concave parabolic, parabolic mirrors um, and creating a constructive and constructive interference pattern where the, the maximum spark intensity occurred is where uh, the half wavelength or the standing wave occurred at the point. So is everyone okay with that? Okay, the first one that which occurred, the first you know, point at which it occurs from this distance this year from that spark gap is easily in the you know, obviously the half point. And so knowing that, so now using that technique, you calculate the wavelength. So we do know frequency and we know wavelength, what do we do? Velocity, yeah, V equal left lambda. So by simply multiplying the two together, calculate the velocity, and guess what we found? The velocity was approximately equal to the value predicted by Maxwell. And obviously allowed for the experiment as well. So by doing this simple experiment, he gave evidence towards two of Maxwell's predictions. The first prediction being there exists a whole spectrum of EMR outside of the visible light. And he found this invisible one, right? Obviously with a larger wavelength and a lower frequency than visible light, but he found it regardless. He, he found it because and having known it was an EMR, well he found that it could be diffracted and reflected. And he also you know, proved the second prediction, or gave evidence to the second prediction, or prediction, because he found that this electromagnetic radiation that he had found actually traveled at the speed of light. My point is that uh, this guy did a lot of experiments with the ultraviolet light and how it relates to the receiving loop. And by shining ultraviolet light onto it, he found that the spark intensity increased. And in particular, he put a piece of quartz in between the, the, the actual UV light and the, and the receiving loop. And he found that spark intensity did not increase by simply putting a quartz piece of quartz between. What does quartz do with the light? That's what it does. It basically doesn't allow it to go through easily. It pushes it off in different directions. That's why it's, it's dull. Now, if you put a piece of quartz in between the ultraviolet light 
and you know, and the receiver would have still found that the sparking density was exactly the same. So whatever was happening, the ultraviolet light was not being affected by the quartz, and that's what's still affecting the receiver wood, and the radio waves are still passing through it. And in particular, this guy discovered something called the photoelectric effect, that is the ability of light to eject electrons from the surface of a conducting, surface, uh, conducting metal. Okay? So, or not only metal, but anything conducting. And in particular, in this case, whatever the thing was made of, he found that he could eject electrons from there easily and give them a higher energy level. And as a result, when they move across the spark, they move with higher intensity than we saw before. So he accidentally discovered the photoelectric effect, but he didn't do any, any further research into it. That's why we don't encourage him to read. He found the photoelectric effect, but he didn't do any research related to it. He just left it. Okay? So did everyone get that? That took a while, so maybe I should recap very quickly. Maxwell made two predictions with these equations. First prediction, that there exists a whole spectrum of linear mass. Second prediction, they all travel at sea. Then what happened? Um, Heinrich Hirsch decided to set up an experiment. That's an experiment. He had a receiving loop, a, uh, and an induction loop with an induction coil on it. Induction coil is just a fancy name for a step-up transformer. What did, then, what did he then do? He found that spark in the induction coil could actually produce a spark in the receiving loop. And what happened then? He, well, he wanted to prove the first prediction. So what he did was he diffracted the light by putting a barrier. He found that it moved across it, moved around it. He reflected the light by using concave parabolic mirrors. And as a result, he proved that this thing here is a wave, it has wave properties, and therefore is uh, some sort of invisible wave that we cannot see. And therefore, he concluded that it's E and R. So he gave evidence towards that. The second one, well, what did he do? He had to measure the velocity of this, this wave. Well, he knew the frequency from the frequency of the induction coil. And he calculated the wavelength by simply setting up standing waves. Okay, using constructive and destructive interference. Wherever the, wherever the spark was maximum or maximal, that is where the spark, uh, that is where the standing waves actually combine together. Then as a result, that would be some sort of multiple or half wavelength. The first one would obviously be half wavelength itself, the second one would be the full wavelength. And by then using these two pieces of information, that is the wavelength and the frequency, and multiplying them together, he got the value of the velocity, which he found was very close to the speed of light known at the time, or the one that predicted by Maxwell. And he gave, two pieces of he gave evidence towards these two predictions that the last one. Now, after all this, he found that while he was experimenting, UV light shot onto the receiving loop, producing a more intense spark. He couldn't explain it, and he found that if he also blocked it with quartz, it still produced such an intense spark as well. And he couldn't explain why this happened, but he now know in hindsight that he actually discovered the ultra, uh, ultra hard effect, the photoelectric Okay, which is the ability of photons that in light particles to eject electrons from the surface of the planet. Are there any questions?